Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for, for music, music teachers. teachers. This is the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and you're listening to episode 23, which is an interview with Graham Fitch, first recorded in February of 2018. Enjoy. Hi, teachers. Oh my gosh, do I have a treat to share with you today. I have an interview with the wonderful Graham Fitch. Graham Fitch runs the blog Practicing the Piano, and it's just a treasure trove. I mean, he wrote these books that completely changed the way that I thought about practicing myself and also helped me to get some of these ideas, which he focuses on mostly intermediate and advanced students, and take it down to the beginner level so I could get my students practicing correctly from the very start. It really revolutionized how I thought about practice getting results from my practice time, and just teaching in general. So they're wonderful books. He's a wonderful blog as well. And he's here today to share just some fantastic insights, some of his practice strategies, and we talk about his piano teaching journey, and also about how he practices himself, because he's still performing and he needs to prepare things, and how does he go about it as the practice expert. At the very start of the interview, there were some issues with the video. I apologize. The sound is still good and the information is fab. So I've decided to include that as is. And then the video will kick in just about 30 seconds, one minute in. So just bear with me there. Some technical glitches as I was traveling around recording these interviews for you. I really hope you enjoy the interview today, though. It's absolutely fantastic, well worth watching, and I know you'll get a lot out of it. Let me know if you have any questions about what we chatted about or thoughts that come up as you're listening to the interview today. Okay, so I'm at the home studio of Graham Fitch today to chat with him about practice. You may know Graham from his blog, which is Practicing the Piano, or his online academy. And he also does lots of teaching and works with the Steinway Hall and videos and all this sort of stuff. So it's fantastic that you could join me today. Thank you so much, Graham. Welcome, Nicola. Yeah, it's lovely to see you. Um, First of all, I just want to actually thank you because... When I started looking into practicing myself and how I could practice better, that's when I found your blog uh-huh. and, and your books, and they just helped me open up that whole world of efficient practice and actually doing hard work at the Vienna rather than just playing through things and hoping it sticks. I'm very glad. Yeah, that's the, I think that's the main thing with practice. It's got, yeah. to, it's got to be methodical for it to work. Exactly. You have to have goals, right? Yes. So that's what we're going to chat a bit about today. Yeah. I went before this interview back to the very, very start of your blog, which okay. was March 2011. Wow, yes, that's quite a while back. Yes. Quite a while <laughs> you've been going. And in that post, you talked about how you felt very fortunate to have had teachers who taught you how to practice. Yes. Is that why you started the blog in the first place? Is that what came to you? Well, I, I think if you look at the, in the field of piano pedagogy, piano teaching, piano playing, there seemed to be a lot of people writing about the, the repertoire, um, a lot of people writing about aspects of technique. And I thought, well, what's missing in my experience as a piano teacher has often been know-how for practice. Mm. So I would say, I would ask a student, which is really where it came from. When I was a, a youngster, I had a teacher who uh, used to ask me, I'd say, well, I'm having a trouble with this bit, and point to the relevant bars on the score. And he mm. would say, so how are you practicing it? And that made me think because it wasn't actually just do this yeah. and it'll be fixed. It was a process that he was wanting me to be aware of. So that during the lessons between, sorry, during the week between the lessons, yeah. I would have something tangible to actually do when I came to the piano rather than just open the book and sort of start at the beginning and get to the end two or three times, which is probably what a lot of people do I unless they know. Most of us did, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I was certainly walked through practice in the lesson, but I was never told that that was what was happening. I think it's so important that he said, how are you going to practice that and got you involved yes. in actually yes. you know, verbalizing how it works. Which, which is what I do with my students now if they're yeah. having a problem with something. It might be a technical problem. It might be something that could just be quickly fixed in the, in the course of a lesson just instantly. But it also could be, I've often found um, 
people call things but technical problems, but they're actually perceptual problems. They haven't really figured out what's going on on a page. Yeah. So that, that, of course, is where practice comes in. I had somebody come the other day for a lesson who, I mean, she was a professional pianist in the sense that she graduated from a conservatory and there were areas of her pieces that never actually unraveled. So she said, I'm having a problem with this bar, I'm having a problem with that bar. And then I looked at it and it, she hadn't actually unraveled what was on the page. So just penetrating the score is one thing that should happen in a practice, during yes. the practice. And do you find the problem in a lot of cases when that happens is actually the rhythm? Or do you find it's usually something else? They've not what looked closely <laughs> at the score. Just not looking. Just not looking. So it could be the fact that, say, a middle note of a chord is held for a crotchet and there's a moving voice on, on either side, and they haven't seen that. They've just played, played a blob. An idea of... A blob, yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, an idea, of, sort of the idea of what it is. Mm -hmm. And if you constantly repeat, whatever you constantly repeat will become ingrained, exactly. as we know. Yeah. So she had just ingrained what I would call kind of laziness, a lack of really looking to see what's in the score, what the composer has taken pains to notate. Also, when I was reading that post, I came across this idea of this clinic that you set up in a university. Yeah, so the, well, the practice clinic was just basically the idea of the practice clinic was to get pianists together to problem solve, which would, would mean sitting around the piano and not talking about technique. And that's, I would try and avoid talking about technique because the students were coming from different teachers, so I didn't want to say something about technical that might contradict somebody else's right, uh, uh, colleague. Yeah. yeah, so what we did was we confined it purely to practicing, solving problems through practice strategies, processes. Yeah. Yeah, so students would just, was it like an open... Yeah, open, open in, open sort of invitation. People would drop in and out. And... Um, it would affect the work that they did during the week, how they would sit, what they would do day, to, yeah. day by day. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And hopefully help their teachers without you. Well, yes, my role right. was to help people with their piano playing and, and not to tread on toes. So if I would say something about a wrist position, for example, that would clash with a colleague's instruction on that, then I would not be doing a particularly useful job there. So I avoided giving instructions about technical matters and just to do with process yeah but also helpful for the teachers because then they turn up at their next yes. lesson the students <laughs> yeah. a little bit better practice yes. right which yeah. is always more i think a bit more clued up as to what to do yeah there's a lot of them it didn't really know how to practice so they had all this time so what they do is they they just sort of play until something went wrong kind of jab at that passage a few times until they kind of got it right and then move on to the next bit almost hoping that something would go wrong, so they've got something to fix, they've yeah. something to do. <laughs> yes, I've had that idea so yeah, funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah, just starting at the beginning and then trying to find a place where there's an error so that you've something to, yeah. to focus on. Yeah, and, and just not understanding that practice is the opposite of playing, well, not always the opposite of playing through, but unless you're practicing a performance, practicing a playthrough, yeah. then you probably do not want to be doing mindless playthroughs. Exactly, mm. yeah. I'd love to dive into some of the specific practice techniques that you have in your books, because I, I love your books. Thank you. One of them that you have, which is such a simple idea, but I use it all the time with my students, is the three S's. Oh, yes, the three S's. Yeah. Yes, when you write about piano playing, you, mm. you end up with a bit of jargon. You, know, you, you come up with jargon. And I just thought three, the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, yeah, which yeah, is sort yeah. of the basis of um, grammar, e English. Well, no, it wasn't so much English. It was just education back in the Victorian times. And I thought, well, how can we get to the basics of piano practice? And so I came up with the three S's, slowly, separately, and sections, working in small sections, because a lot of people don't do that. I think a lot of people don't do any of those things. No. The idea of sections is one of the things that when I started improving my own practice, it just transformed the whole thing. Actually breaking things up into sections breaking was a foreign far, yeah. far yeah. concept to me. Was it? Yeah, because yeah. when you think about you know, processing information, whether that's mm -hmm. learning notes or, or refining phrasing or sound or fixing mistakes, the working memory contain a certain amount of information, they say seven plus two, isn't it? seven or nine pieces of information for the, oh, yeah, for the working yeah, yeah. memory. So whatever that equates to, it's, it, it's not literally seven or nine notes on the page, but it's a small enough section so that you feel like you can hold that section in your hand so that by the time you get to the end of that section, you've remembered everything that's happened during exactly. the section. Exactly. could be yeah. a bar. I like one bar plus one note. So we've yeah. got that 
jargon even more, BBB plus one. One bar, so bar by bar plus one, so one bar plus one note, stop. Yeah. And repeat that bar. Yeah. I do that with my students. I put a little post-it after the first beat of the next bar because otherwise they just, the temptation is there to just totally. keep going. And that's the thing. I think that's the thing with practice. It's that reining in the temptation just to want to sit and play, which is, for me, spending. Mm-hmm. You know, sitting and playing your pieces through is spending. Yeah. And practicing is investing and saving. Yes. So it's a it's a balance between the two. You know, if you keep spending, 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 you'll find that the piece gets worse and worse and worse. You'll find a piece you even could play really well starts to get a bit ragged around the edges, and then little errors creep in. Yeah. The sound gets a bit rough, maybe, or the control gets a little less than yes. it was. And so I often do this with students. So I'll I'll say to them something like, "I can see that that's happening." Well, I'll give you an example. I had a student who won a competition and went over to, to America to play the finals and flew him across and all of that. And he played his program and was a great success. And he came back and shelved those pieces for a while until his school asked him, would he play those pieces that he won the competition with? So sure, he said he would play them. Um, and he brought them to the lesson just before, which was probably three weeks after he'd, okay. or th- three or four, about maybe a month after he'd last played. And they were in not very good condition. And I said, when was the last time you practiced this piece slowly? And he said, well, when I, when I learned it. And I did this thing where I, I dusted this table last week, but the dust's come back because I'm using this room. I'm using this space. So the dust, even if I weren't using the space, the dust would the dust accumulate. Would, yeah. So it is with pieces that we think we know we've got to constantly work on accuracy. And that means don't always play through. Don't always just get your score up or play from memory from the beginning to the end. Do something that probes a little deeper. Maybe take it back again to the sorts of stages that you did when you learned the notes in the first place. Yes. How is the left hand sounding by itself? Can you play it without the pedal? Can you make it sound really good without the pedal? Can you play it half the speed? Can you work in small sections? Can you start at the end and work, work backwards section by section? These yeah. are the sorts of things that, for me, count as practice versus yes, exactly. playing through. Yeah. That idea of playing slowly, I find the worst with my adult students, actually, adult beginners who come to me, and they just want it to sound like the music straight away. Like, they just expect it to instantly sound like their actual, the music that they're familiar with, if it's a piece that they know or something like that, that they wanted to play. How can you encourage students to slow down apart from using the metronome? Well, I don't. I actually don't like the metronome particularly. Yeah. I'm not completely against it, but I, th- I think it can become a really kind of crippling crutch in the yeah. sense that it doesn't actually strengthen rhythm. It just shows you whether you're in time with a mechanical object. And I've got this theory that if you found a recording of, say, the most motoric, what you'd think of as strict piece of music, something like the C minor prelude from Book One of Bach, Mm. Let's say you found a recording that you really loved. It was sounds completely straight, and you put a metronome on with it. You managed to find the metronome speed of the player. Yeah, it would be out within a bar. Yeah, even if no music fits into a metronomic kind of. No, the way I do it is I sometimes use this, this analogy of the uh, marshmallow experiment. Yes, Sanford marshmallow, yeah. Sanford whatever it was, where they put a marshmallow in front of a young child and said, "You can eat that right now," or if you wait half an hour, whatever the time length was, we'll give you two. Yeah. You know, two. And even the young child was able to see the greater reward for just chilling a bit, waiting. So if the adult, or indeed anybody who wants the instant gratification of playing through, is, is made aware that there's a process, mm-hmm. it's a step ladder approach. You can't go from the bottom rung of the ladder to the top rung of the ladder without going through the intermediary rungs. Mm-hmm. And to learn to enjoy the slow practice, I think this is something that people don't do. Yes, but I think that's something to, that comes to people very much later on. Yeah, and if it's modelled to them, I often mm-hmm. will sit and show show people what the ultra slow practice is, the speed of no mistakes, practicing at the speed of no mistakes, which could be one keystroke and then contemplation, reflection, and then the next keystroke, so that before you play anything, the command is, is tangible. I'm going to play a C sharp with mm-hmm. my fourth finger of my right hand, and it's going to be mezzo forte. And I'm going to make a lovely tenuto on that. Yeah. I'm going to enjoy the physical sensation of contacting my keyboard and listening to the sound. That's conscious speed of no mistakes type of practice. Yeah, I love that phrase, the speed of no mistakes. Yes. And I often demonstrate. 
or I have my other student there, I'll demonstrate this is slow now. This is actually what slow sounds like because otherwise they just they have no frame of reference for it in the beginning, I think, and how it could sound in practice. Yes, well, if I, if I ask somebody to demonstrate a slow practice speed, it'll just be usually a tiny little bit slower, yeah. <laughs> and then it'll just come come right back out. But I've often found, particularly with boys who like some some sort of really kind of clear instruction about slow practice, that they'd like to know what do you mean by slow. So I'll say half the. Let's see if we can find half the speed. So what speed would you like to be able to play this piece at, or do you feel that it should go at? Can you play it at half that speed? And then can you play it at a quarter of this? In other words, half that. And they like that because the pulse can be, you know, if this is a crotchet pulse for the eventual speed, it, you can make that the, the pulse for the quavers and then the pulse for the semi quavers, mm -hmm. you know? Simple. It, it, it's straightforward because yeah. then you can actually log what the, what the speed of, what the slow speed what is. is. Yeah. But I do have one other thing to say about this, which I think is really important. Um, that if teachers don't witness the slow practice, it's not going to happen. Yeah. But that's the same with everything with practice. I think that's where we go on a lot of the time, is we don't let enough of the practice happen in the lesson, yeah, like yeah. a full walkthrough of exactly what's going to happen. Because yeah. just telling a, you know, an 8-year-old, even a 15-year-old, do this this way at home, mm. it's not going to happen. No, it won't happen unless it's... Unless it's um, witnessed in the lesson and encouraged and refined a bit. I mean, I'll, I'll often ask before somebody plays their piece to me, I'll say, I remember last week we were, I was asking you to do some slow practice. I'm dying to hear how that sounds. Can you show me your slow practice? Yeah. And just two minutes, that's all it needs. Not even two minutes, one yeah. minute of a, of a lesson for me to hear, for them to actually model, model that to me, show me what they've been doing. And I, can, I might make one or two suggestions. I say, it could be even slow, you know, or... Fantastic. Let's continue to do that and just realize that you can do that in your practice between lessons. Yeah. I know one teacher who um, excuses themselves to go to the bathroom and asks them to practice. Ah, uh, listens to what listens they're doing. to what they're actually yeah. doing when they've snuck out. I love this idea that you came up with as well of putting p sections of pieces in quarantine. Yes, I find my students really gel with that, whatever. We come up with different names for it, but that idea of just... This one's on a timeout or whatever way you want to talk about it, you know. Where did you come up with the idea of quarantine? Is it just something you, you developed in your bag of tricks or? It's a bag of tricks. It's, it's something I developed. The, the, the term quarantine, I guess, would, would be, um, you know, if somebody was sick, they'd need extra TLC. <laughs> so you, if they were in a hospital, let's say, they would be looked after regularly by um, the nursing staff yeah. <laughs> they get a little bit more attention than than just you know once once, the, once a day or whatever would be ongoing mm -hmm. so the idea would be to um, ju just to kind of note somehow on the score or on, on the practice notebook the sections of music that are weak links remember that TV program you are the weakest link yes. whatever. <laughs> yeah. uh, mm -hmm. yes you've got you've got that kind of feeling that, well a chain is only as strong as its weakest link isn't it mm -hmm. so if you've got say a measure there that's not working or a small section over here on the third page it's not work not working one would need to extract those two places and do some special practice mm -hmm. over and above so I, I will often ask somebody you know um, do you watch movies on the television they say, yeah, and I say, what do you do in, in the commercial breaks? I say, well, I just sit there and play with my iPad. <laughs> well, how about during the commercial break, how long are they, five minutes, yeah. come to the piano and just do one quarantine spot really nicely, and that's, that's like over and above your routine practice. Yeah. So start your practice with the quarantine spots from all the pieces. It could be a scale that, that you put in quarantine. Start the practice with those. Practice your first piece. Go back to the quarantine. Practice your second piece, finish your practice with the quarantine, and then make a couple of trips back to the piano during the course of the day for the quarantine. Yes. And then the teacher would, I always ask for the quarantine spots before they play the piece, because I'm, again, modeling what I want them to do in their practice. Exactly, yeah. And if I can see that they've not done it, I'll work on, on those sections with them again. And then if the same situation happens the week after that they haven't done it, I will say, well, I'm afraid, you know, that you can't put your sick patients back in the... So we'll have to leave that this week. So I don't hear the rest of the piece. And okay. they soon know, ah, yes, they must actually practice those those places first. Yeah, because until those are better, there's no point working on the rest yeah, of the piece. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I love the idea of keeping a practice diary and 
I don't know if this is something you do yourself or you yes. encourage your students to do. Yes, behind you there, there's a big black uh, book that was actually a, in a reject of pile in a bookshop because it wasn't printed. It was a nice sort of coffee table style book that was, they just didn't print it. So it was being sold as a kind of notebook thing. Okay. And I've had it for years and I keep it very close to the piano whenever I've got ideas uh, or I need to log something, I will use that as my practice notebook yeah but i think with practice diary practice notebook is for people that are having regular lessons who need a little bit of structure mm -hmm. um i quite like the idea of having two columns so one what you plan to do yeah one what you actually end up doing because if you don't end up doing what you've planned you have to rejig it a little bit because i don't think it practicing is not it's not an exact science is it you might find you you know you're really on a roll with something and you yes. spend a little bit more time on that than you'd hoped. So therefore, you didn't quite manage to do everything. So you just rejig the, the, what you do the next day. Yeah, but even the act of making a plan mm. of what you're going to do is so valuable, even if you don't yes. end up doing all of that. Yes, and I think the other thing that's really valuable is the reflection afterwards. Yeah. The reflecting on how did you do. So if you're playing piece through from beginning to end, don't immediately dive in and go over those spots that didn't work. Chill, sit back with, with your notebook and write a few reflections. Could simply be, well, actually, I think it's on the right track. I'm, I seem to be getting close to the temper that I want, but I'm still not happy with my left hand control in, in the second subject. I need to do a little bit of work on the left hand there, for example. And then you might write, you might write down what it is you need to do. So a few bullet points. I think that needs a little bit more accent practice or maybe some practice using a different rhythm whatever it may be, or maybe st some staccato practice if the fingers aren't articulating clearly, whatever it may be. So you, the, what you've got then is a reflection in bullet form for the next practice session, rather than mindlessly, literally mindlessly, yes, hacking right. away at the piece, you know, with no yeah. kind of time for reflection. Because you talk about these three sections of the practice standard. Yes, yeah, the feedback loop. Yes. Feedback. Well, you see, the feedback loop, if you imagine three boxes, box A, box B, box C, mm -hmm. box A is what you do before you play. So if I'm to pick up my phone to take a photo, I, l I focus my image and my subject, and then I know when I'm ready to press the shutter. Yeah. So I plan what it is that I want to do before I do it. Then the box B is the playing bit itself. It's the, it could be just one bar. It could be a whole recital program. Whatever. Yeah. Box C is where you evaluate yes, no. So in other words, did is what I did in box B, did it match what I intended to do in box A? Mm -hmm. And then you can put a tick. If not, in what ways did it not match what I intended? Feed that information back into a new box A. See what I'm saying? Yeah. So that then when you do your, when you repeat anything, you've got concrete, tangible uh, plan for what it is you want. Yeah, and it, it's also a tangible way of actually listening to what Yeah, you've got to listen, yes. yes. <laughs> like students who are, they're just playing something and they're not even, it's music, you have to turn down your ears, yeah, yeah. you know? Totally. Yeah, 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 and feed that back. What do you do when you start a new piece of music these days? You say it's going to be something that's fairly challenging, you know? Well, okay, good, very good question. I think the first thing I do is not to go anywhere near the piano. Okay. Not to go near the piano. If I if I know the piece well, or I just haven't played it, I, I would probably sit with the score for a while, quite a while. Um, you know, understanding the shape of the piece, the character of the themes, hearing it in my head, analyzing mm -hmm. the structure, the harmony, the, the the form, and then I might listen to some recordings, but I would listen to quite a number of them. I wouldn't listen to just one, yeah. and I would only listen at that kind of stage of the. Okay. Um, I wouldn't listen later. And then, then I think what I'd also, well, certainly not I think, I'd say what I'd do is do a bit of research. Mm -hmm. This is for my diploma people. I always say, write your program notes once you've chosen the program, because then you've got something to, that you'll find out from research about what it is that you want to bring out in your own performance. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, the Mozart A minor sonata, uh, K310, you know, a lot of people don't know that he wrote that sonata in the wake of his mother's sudden yeah. tragic death, and it's filled with despair and tragedy. No, that what they do is they they bring it. Say, well, should I have any pedal in this first left hand? And I'm thinking, well, 
Get, let's get to that later. Let's first of big all, first. yeah, big picture first. So a bit of research, much research as you can really do. Um, what was going on in the composer's life at the time? Mm -hmm. um, what other music was he or she writing around that time? Listen to that. So if you're playing Opus 10 Beethoven number one sonata, listen to number two. Yeah. Listen to number three. For, are there any links there that you can find between thematic sort of, you know, structural mm -hmm. similarities or motivic similarities? Because he was writing those kind of together. So it's just a question of, for me of getting as much clarity on all of that before I then go to the piano. And I don't necessarily start at the beginning. Yeah. Do you jump to a section that you think is going to be challenging? Yeah, I may, do, I may do. May yeah. very well do. Or I may start with the last movement. You know, see, I've got to remember the inspiration from Rosina Levine. I'm sure that's a familiar yeah. name, founder of the Juilliard Piano Department with her husband, Josef, who mm -hmm. um, used to ask students for the last movements of things. So they'd go in with a concerto or a sonata. Oh, yeah. And she said, what are you bringing today? I said, oh, such and such a concerto. Play me the last movement. No, play me the coda of the last movement. Yeah. So her students were primed to learn from the end. Mm. You get to the first movement last, maybe. Yeah. Not necessarily, but but the idea also, if you've got a big piece, learn a, learn a little bit of the beginning. Maybe learn something of the second theme. Look at the recapitulation. Have a little look at the first, uh, the second movement, and, and look at the coda of the last movement. Yes. So I'll often assign students. You know, they bring a sonata. This is what I'd like to hear next week. Let's explore this, this, this next yeah. week. So otherwise it just gets good at the beginning and then there's a kind of... It gradually yeah. fades <laughs> away. You get a diminuendo of accomplishment. Through the... <laughs> exactly, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this was fantastic. I'd love it if, if there's teachers watching this who um, they've never really taught their students much about practice or never thought about this a lot themselves. What would you say is the first thing they could try to do if they want to get their students to focus more on how they're practicing or teach practice better? Well, I've written a lot about practicing. It's completely free. Just my blog, practicingthepiano.com. Uh, there is a website, a subscription site connected with that, but you don't have to have anything to do with that. You don't have to go on there to get the information. Yeah. Um, I think, well, I, I teach practicing on the Piano Teachers course UK, which is oh, yeah. with my lovely colleagues, uh, Lucinda Macrithian, mm -hmm. uh, Sally Cathcart and Ilga, uh, Ilga Petrovic, and we, we have Roshan Magab, who's actually sadly leaving us at the end of the year. Um, we have a lovely piano teacher's course that we, we teach. Uh, it's part-time, um, so we cover a lot of ground there for practicing. Um, I give workshops through the UK uh, yeah. on practicing. And I think it just just practically speaking, just to ask the student and to ask yourselves, um, how am I going to solve that problem? Make a checklist, you know, like a bullet point list of first this, then this, then this, then this. Yeah. I mean, can I share, have, have you got time for me to share a story with you about my yes, postgraduate, my, my final teacher, Nina Svetlanova, who was an amazing, amazing teacher. She was a student of Neuhaus and represented the, the very best of the Russian school mm -hmm. um the modern russian school i was i remember taking along a chopin scherzo to her and i was struggling with one bit and she asked me how am i practicing it so i said i'm doing whatever it was she said yes meaning yes and so i and then i said uh, oh and i'm also doing she said yes 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 and i had to generate uh, probably about 10 things that i was doing and she said it's that fifth thing that you were doing there uh, that's stop that's what's stopping it all the other things great but don't do that fifth thing because in other words that was counteracting the, the, the other. Um, oh, okay. So if one's practicing to get developed speed, for example, the last thing you'd want to do is to practice slowly at the end of all of that. Yeah. You know, because it, that's the time you're forming the reflexes for speed. Don't practice slowly. That's counter, uh, it's going to run counter to what it is you want to do. You can, after you develop the reflexes for speed, then you can go back and practice it slowly afterwards, but slowly again. In other words, you probably learned it slowly. Yeah. Then you develop the speed. During that stage, do not practice slowly because you know, yeah. it, it gets in the way. Only when you're going back to maintain. Yes, yeah. for the third stage. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But practicing, it, it's really something that once you start to engage with, with it, it's fascinating. You start to notice yeah. what's happening. Yeah. yeah. And there's a lovely little book called Practicing the Piano uh, where I got my blog's name from by somebody called Frank Merrick. Okay. You still get that book. 
quite old. I think it's from the 1950s. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. Very nice book. Uh, his practicing, spelt with an S, the English way, practicing the piano. Yes, as is your book. Yes, yes. Uh, I get a, some of my American readers write in and say, oh, you do you know there's a typo? <laughs> I say, no, spelling in the English way. Yeah. My blog is colorful, so yes, with a it's U. got the extra U. Of yes, course. same problem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, people should be sure to check it out. So practicing <laughs> with the S. With the S. The piano.com. Yes, that's and it. The academy and all that. Yes, stuff. the online academy. You'll see that on the on the practicingthepiano dot com website. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Thanks so much for joining Thanks, me today. Nicola. Thank lovely you. to lovely to chat to you. I really hope you enjoyed that interview with Graham. The audio was obviously not up to the standard it is when I'm recording in my home studio here, but it's still super valuable information and I wanted to share it with you here because it was recorded before I started this podcast, so obviously hadn't been shared here, it had only been shared on the YouTube channel. So I really hope you enjoyed that today and got a lot out of it. I'll be back with you again on Monday with episode 24. See you then. If you want access to more great piano teacher training, make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel. In fact, you can catch these podcasts right on the YouTube channel if that's what suits you, but there's tons of other stuff too. Tutorials, reviews, and quick clips where I share excerpts of my teaching in action so you can really see me teaching in my studio. So find it by searching for Colourful Keys on YouTube and subscribe today.